May 1st. Observe the Nufar Advina, yellow water lily, in blossom. Also the Laurus benzoin, or fever bush, spicewood, near William Wheeler's in Lincoln, resembling the witch hazel. It is remarkable that this aromatic shrub, though it grows by the roadside and does not hide itself, may be, as it were, effectually concealed, though it blossoms every spring. It may be observed only once in many years. The blossom buds of the peach have expanded just enough to give a slight peach tint to the orchards. In regard to purity, I do not know whether I am much worse or better than my acquaintances. If I confine my thought to myself, I appear, whether by constitution or by education, irrevocably impure, as if I should be shunned by my fellow men if they knew me better, as if I were of two inconsistent natures. But again, when I observe how the mass of men speak of woman and of chastity, with how little love and reverence, I feel that so far I am unaccountably better than they. I think that none of my acquaintances has a greater love and admiration for chastity than I have. Perhaps it is necessary that one should actually stand low himself in order to reverence what is high in others. All distant landscapes seen from hilltops are veritable pictures, which will be found to have no actual existence to him who travels to them. It is distance lends enchantment to the view. It is the bare landscape without this depth of atmosphere to glass it. The distant river reach seen in the north from the Lincoln Hill, high in the horizon, like the ocean stream flowing round Homer's shield, the rippling waves reflecting the light, is unlike the same seen near at hand. Heaven intervenes between me and the object. By what license do I call it Concord River? It redeems the character of rivers to see them thus. They were worthy then of a place on Homer's shield. As I looked today from Mount Tabor in Lincoln to the Waltman Hill, I saw the same deceptive slope, the near hill melting into the further inseparably, indistinguishably. It was one gradual slope from the base of the near hill to the summit of the further one, a succession of copsewoods. But I knew that there intervened a valley two or three miles wide, studded with houses and orchards, and drained by a considerable stream. When the shadow of a cloud passed over the nearer hill, I could distinguish its shaded summit against the side of the other. I had in my mind's eye a silent grey tarn which I had seen the summer before high up on the side of a mountain, bald mountain, where the half-dead spruce trees stood far in the water draped with wreathy mist, as with Usniamos, made of dews, where the mountain spirit bathed, whose bottom was high above the surface of other lakes. Spruces, whose dead limbs were more in harmony with the mists which draped them. The forenoon that I moved to my house, a poor old lame fellow, who had formerly frozen his feet, hobbled off the road, came and stood before my door with one hand on each doorpost, looking into the house, and asked for a drink of water. I knew that rum or something like it was the only drink he loved, but I gave him a dish of warm pond water, which was all I had, nevertheless, which to my astonishment he drank, being used to drinking. Nations. What are nations? Tartars and Huns and Chinamen. Like insects, they swarm. The historian strives in vain to make them memorable. It is for want of a man that there are so many men. It is individuals that populate the world. The Spirit of Lodin I look down from my height on nations, and they become ashes before me. Calm is my dwelling in the clouds. Pleasant are the great fields of my rest. Man, 
is as singular as God. There is a certain class of unbelievers who sometimes ask me such questions as, if I think that I can live on vegetable food alone, and to strike at the root of the matter at once, I was accustomed to answer such, yes, I can live on board nails. If they cannot understand that, they cannot understand much that I have to say. That cuts the matter short with them. For my own part, I am glad to hear of experiments of this kind being tried, as that of a young man tried for a fortnight to see if he could live on hard, raw corn on the ear, using his tooth for his only mortar. The squirrel tribe tried the same and succeeded. The human race is interested in these experiments, though a few old women may be alarmed, who own their thirds in mills. Khaled would have his weary soldiers vigilant still, apprehending a midnight sally from the enemy. Let no man sleep, said he. We shall have rest enough after death. Would such an exhortation be understood by Yankee soldiers? Omar answered the dying Abu Bekr, O successor to the apostle of God, spare me from this burden. I have no need of the caliphate. But the caliphate has need of you, replied the dying Abu Bekr. Heraclius had heard of the mean attire of the caliph Omar and asked why, having gained so much wealth by his conquests, he did not go richly glad like other princes. They replied that he cared not for this world, but for the world to come, and sought favor in the eyes of God alone. In what kind of a palace does he reside? asked the emperor. In a house built of mud. Who are his attendants? Beggars and the poor. What tapestry does he sit upon? Justice and equity. What is his throne? Abstinence and true knowledge. What is his treasure? Trust in God. And who are his guard? The bravest of the Unitarians. It was custom of Zayad, once governor of Basora, wherever he held sway to order the inhabitants to leave their doors open at night, with merely a hurdle at the entrance to exclude cattle, engaging to replace anything that should be stolen, and so effective was his police that no robberies were committed. Abdallah was so fixed and immovable in prayer that a pigeon once perched upon his head, mistaking him for a statue.